first of all, I want to welcome you to worship with uh, the Philadelphia Taylor and Unity Churches. It's always a wonderful thing that you will share your Sunday mornings or whenever you hear this with us. Let's pause before we begin our service today with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together to celebrate you, to hear your word proclaimed, to have it explained in some cases. Lord, hear our praise, accept the praise in our hearts, and we lift all honor and glory to you, God. All honor and glory and thanks to you for the wonderful things that have happened to us since last we met. And Lord, for those ways that we failed you, we ask your forgiveness. For those that are in good health and good spirit, thank you, Lord, and may that continue to be so. But for those, Lord, who are facing illness or sorrow in their families, Lord, I lift them up and pray your guidance, your comfort, your care, and your truth for them. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. morning's lesson text is from Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. 
No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and may only your words be spoken and heard today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The verses for today's message are part of the long discourse from Matthew that we referred to as the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And in this, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He hasn't had them very long, and so he's really got to teach them. The first list of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, all of those, they seem to fit together. But then all of a sudden, it's kind of like Jesus turns his, um, I don't know, turns his way of teaching or something. And then it seems like for the next two and a half chapters of Matthew's gospel, we get bits and pieces of something. And it's, it's kind of like, these are different teachings of Jesus that are just somehow kind of strung together in some almost haphazard way. When reading Matthew, sometimes we have to realize that maybe Matthew didn't write down all these words himself, but these words were put together by his disciples, uh, those who followed him and wrote down the teachings of Matthew and those things that he taught them. I don't know, but they, some of these verses could have been written by Matthew's followers. And that would account for what seems like some of the abrupt changes. I can't say that for sure, but sometimes it just seems like things, there's a break. And so that's what we're going to uh, be Sorry, looking at today. Sure my watch started talking. <clears throat> Neither Mark or John reports anything like the Sermon on the Mount. And if it had been this one long discourse, possibly they would have mentioned it too. But Luke does. He has something similar to this, but he calls it his Sermon on the Plain. So it makes me wonder if Jesus actually gave all of this material, all of this teaching at one time, at one sitting. Could this simply be different ways or different sayings of his that are strung together for Matthew's readers? I don't know. But most of this sermon does appear in one form or another, these verses will appear within um, the other Gospels. And Jesus was too good a teacher just to begin the retreat as he did and then simply ramble on and on. But what we can notice from the first Beatitudes, 1 through 12, what we can notice from those and then this passage that I read to you, verses 13 through 20, is that there's a change in mood. Something changes here. And Jesus directly addresses the disciples with, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? That's a saying that's made it 
into our everyday lives. How many of you know someone or have heard of someone being referred to as the salt of the earth? That's what I would say about my grandfather. He was the salt of the earth. And you might say that, and I can say that about my dad too. A charter plane was about to take off from an airport in Acapulco. When a young man dashed up to the gate counter and he had his ticket and he explained that he was supposed to be on that flight and he, he had to get on it because if he didn't, he was gonna be in so much trouble and he just had to get on it. Wouldn't they please just call the pilot and tell him to stop and let him run out and get, after all, his, his bags were already on the plane. And the gate attendant explained that from where he was, he couldn't contact the pilot. There was no way to stop the plane and to get him out to it, but he was very, very sorry. Well, it, there wasn't another plane that he could catch for like another three or four days. And he, um, that was going to cost him another $800. For four hours, the gate attended contacting all agencies, going through the book of all these agencies that were supposed to help stranded travelers, but there was no such luck. And finally, um, Mr. Magana, the gate attendant said, there's nothing else that I can do. There's only one place that I can think of. And he said, and that's my house. For the next week, the young uh, high school counselor remained in Acapulco with no baggage, little money, and the information that another flight would leave in four days. So he went with this gate attendant, nice man. This young teacher, counselor, who taught in a wealthy Minneapolis suburb, and he went to this modest airport worker's home where, and stayed with him, with, with, with him and his family. He ate at their table played chess with Enrique, the gate attendant, and read books and played with the kids while their mother earned $5 a day as a school teacher. Asked when he got home, someone asked him, he said, how he accounted for the Airport Workers Act, and Steve said, some people make a commandment out of manuals and protocols. Others try kindness. People like Enrique Morgana, the airport gatekeeper, are the salt of the earth. Jesus expected that kind of activity from his disciples and he told them that they were the salt of the earth. They could give life the special quality that makes it worth living, not only by works of love and mercy and kindness, but by being what Christians are meant to be and by communicating the good news to all the people they met. That means the disciples were the light of the world. That light was the gospel. Their faith in Christ and in his word in that pagan society made them like a beacon guiding a lost ship to safety. Their light couldn't be hidden any more than a city on the top of a hill could hide in the darkness. So Jesus commanded them, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's a lot easier than said, said than done because a lot of times our lights tend to grow dim and even go out at times. Sometimes the connection to the power source is broken and just through our own negligence and spiritual failures. There was a pastor who 
as he began his ministry was constantly making headlines. And the church was just growing by leaps and bounds and he was attracting all different kinds of people to the church. It was a wonderful thing. The church was just seemed to be exploding. People were always talking about him and about what he had going on at the church and the sign outside the church announced his cleverly uh, titled sermons with striking titles and carried news of each event that the pastor had planned. Someone asked the assistant to the bishop, what will happen when he runs out of ideas and gimmicks? And the man just replied, oh, I'm sure he'll recharge his batteries and come up with some new ideas and programs that will continue to work. Well, he didn't. He couldn't because he was operating on a superficial, superficial level, doing everything under his own power rather than in spiritual power. He wasn't wired into the power source of the Word and the Holy Spirit. Before long, he moved, he was forgotten, and his programs were abandoned. To be the light of the world means that we are not simply to shine by ourselves. It's not our brilliance that illuminates the darkness of the world that we live in, but it's the light that comes from God in Jesus Christ. It's that sparkle that comes through the eyes of someone who is truly attuned to Jesus. You see, Jesus was the light of the world. And if in measure, any measure, we become the light of the world, it can only be through the power that he makes available to us. We must be connected to the power source, filled with the Holy Spirit. If we aren't, our light will go out. I gave David a toboggan for Christmas, and, and it has a light right in the front so that we could go out and walk the dogs and the light would uh, illuminate where the dogs were because when you've got black dogs, it's kind of hard to see them in the dark spots at night. Well, we charged the cap and we took the dogs out for a couple of nights and then um, we went out one night and to walk Amos and Andy and we realized real quickly that we needed to plug that light up more regularly than we thought because it wasn't light at all. Oh, it was shining, but only enough to, for a car to keep from seeing David, uh, to, to, only enough for a car to see David. And uh, it didn't light the dogs up at all. It wasn't plugged into the source. And that's the way we are. We can't be the light of the world by ourselves. We need to be connected to Christ. And as just like the disciples were, that were with him, they were totally plugged into Christ. And we must be too. Jesus also made it quite clear to them that their lifestyles could either enhance their light or detract from it in the eyes of people whom they met and to whom they preached. Christian freedom doesn't mean that Christians can believe uh, or that believers can live just any way they want to. They can't do just do anything that pleases them. That's the way of the world, not the way of God. Jesus told the disciples Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He did that by his perfect obedience to the law of God. And that cost him his life on the cross. And by giving new meaning to the law with his teaching. Those who flaunt God's laws are definitely treading in some um, 
dangerous territory. And sooner or later, they will pay a price for their transgressions. Freedom from the law means that Christians have been delivered from fulfilling the law to gain their salvation. Only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus could live and abide by every single law of God. We humans just keep failing time and time again. We may have forgotten today in this secular age that Jesus fulfilled the law for us. But Jesus' lifestyle was radically different. And a Christian's lifestyle was radically different in that day than the lifestyle of the non-Christians. Can you tell the difference today between Christians and non-Christians? Can you tell if you walk into a crowd, can you tell what people are Christians and which people aren't? I can't, not all of the time. Jesus' disciples, therefore, were told to be reconcilers, bringing together, not separating people in the community envisioned by God and made real by Jesus Christ in his body and in the church. They were to reconcile people to Jesus through their communion and how they came together. People are at odds with one another or people who are at odds with one another are not fit for the company of God or his community on earth. They damage and destroy it, thereby doing harm to the entire Christian endeavor. There was a church on the surface that seemed to be united. Services went well and the daily affairs of the church were okay. The congregation appeared to be healthy until the administrative council would meet. And when the council would meet, there seemed to be two rival factions in the congregation. They were, they each had their own spokesperson. One of the spokespersons for one group was the head of the council. And the other was held a high office on the council too. They were restrained at the first few meetings after they got their new pastor and the pastor didn't realize what was going on. But finally, they got into an argument that almost turned into a fight. The pastor tried to defuse the controversy by saying, let's look at all sides of this question before we make any decision. Well, interestingly enough, it stopped the near argument. And as they talked things through, they realized that they weren't as far apart as they thought they were. The strange thing was that the two, after they discussed it, they laughed and actually went out and had coffee together and became friends again. When the pastor was sent to a new assignment, the secretary of the church council sent him a letter that said, thank you for acting as peacemaker in our church council meetings. People are may able to do amazing things when they try to be peacemakers in the name of Jesus Christ. It's the key to reconciliation among people and key to, the, to both lay and clergy who preach, teach, and effectively communicate the gospel to the world. 
the four different sayings of Jesus that were in today's gospel reading are integral to each other and they're vital to our ministries today. He has made us the salt of the earth, the light of the world, has gained freedom for us from the fulfillment of the law by his perfect sacrifice and has reconciled us to God and to each other. That's the heart of ministry. So let's get on with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you receive this benediction? Go as a forgiven and holy people to do the will of the one who loves us unconditionally. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <music>